Father, we are thankful for another brand new day that you have given to us. Thank you. And by your grace and by the help of your spirit, we'll take full advantage of all the opportunities that today presents to us. Thank you for our time of fellowship with you. We know you're already present because you promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Welcome, Lord Jesus. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Teach us and establish us in the present truth. We ask in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we continue our study of the book of Isaiah. We're still in the uh, middle part of it where it's all condemned condemnation and woes and uh, prophetic utterances uh, addressing the misbehavior of the people of God, if you like. And um, from chapter 13, which we studied a couple of days ago, uh, or was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Uh, he begins to talk about the burden, and that means the, the um, prophecies concerning all these regions around uh, the people of God, Israel. So yesterday we saw the burden of Babylon. And today uh, in chapter 15, we're gonna see the burden of Moab. Moab is present day Jordan, like I told you yesterday, for you to be able to kind of picture where it is that we're talking about. All right, the burden of Moab, because in the night of R of Moab, is laid waste and brought to silence because in the night care of Moab is laid waste and brought into silence. He's gone up to Bajith and to Dibon and high places to weep. Moab shall howl over Nebo and over Mediba. On all their heads shall be baldness and every beard cut off. In the streets, they shall gird themselves with sackcloth on the tops of their houses and in their streets, everyone shall howl weeping abundantly and Heshbon shall cry and El Ele, their voice shall be heard even unto Jehaz. Therefore the armed soldiers of Moab shall cry out. His life shall be grievous unto him. My heart shall cry out for Moab. His fugitives shall flee unto Zoar and Hephah three years old for by the morning by the mountain up of Luhith, with weeping shall they go it up. For in the way of Horonaim, they shall raise up a cry of destruction. For the waters of Nimrim shall be desolate. For the hay is withered away, the grass faileth, there is no green thing. Therefore the abundance they have gotten, and that which they have laid up, shall they carry away to the brook of the willows. For the cry is gone round about the borders of Moab, and howling thereof unto Eglin, and the howling thereof unto Beer Elim. For the waters of Dimon shall be full of blood. For I will bring more upon Dimon, lions upon him that escapeth of Moab, and upon the remnant of the land. Praise God. Uh, very negative prophecy. Uh, Moab is a, is a funny bunch of people, the people of Moab. If you recall, um, Moab was the son of the elder daughter of Lot. Um, uh, in that incestuous relationship, when they were led out of Sodom and Gomorrah by the angel, the angel instructed that they not look back, Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. But his wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. So it was Lot and his two daughters that escaped. And both of them had this brainwave that because there was no female around, I don't know whether they thought Sodom and Gomorrah was the only uh, other nation in the world. I don't know, but they, they assumed there were no females uh, and they, or rather there were no males or both. No females so that their father could remarry, no males so that they could get married. They decided to, uh, make their father drunken and sleep with him so that they could have children. So the first one went in and when she bore her son, she called him Moab. The second one had a son called him Ammon. And it's these two that 
have always plagued Israel one way or the other. It, it was a kind of love-hate relationship that they had for Israel, especially Moab. You remember after the Exodus, when they were coming out of the land of Egypt and they wanted to pass uh, through Moab, Balak, the king of Moab, was um, threatened by the sheer multitude of the children of Israel. And he was the one who hired Balaam the seer to come and curse the children of Israel. And uh, of course he could not because you cannot curse him whom God has blessed. Uh, largely they were kind of friendly towards uh, the children of Israel because you will see uh, several references where they were kind of accommodating to the people of God. When, when uh, David needed to hide his parents, it was to the king of Moab, he took them. And he told him to please help him hide his parents when Saul was pursuing him all over the place. You know, so generally they would be friendly towards uh, Israel, but when push came to shove, they would ally or they would ally with um, Israel's enemies. We also read about uh, Ruth uh, and her husband, Eli Melech. They moved to Moab when there was famine, but then their experience in the land of their sojourn was very negative. Eli Melech died, his two boys died, and uh, Ruth had to return to Israel with uh, Naomi. The other daughter-in-law didn't come back with her. So they have positive experiences, but largely if they had to choose between Israel and any other nation around them, they would eventually choose the other nation. And so for God to also chastise them, it was because of the way they treated the children of Israel. Remember I told you there will be goat nations and there'll be sheep nations. And those two are judged based on how they dealt with Israel. So we see um, Isaiah prophesying concerning them. You know, uh, there was nothing really positive that he had to say about them. Uh, I'm trying to see nothing really uh, doctrinal, uh, applicable that I want to bring out of this chapter. It's pretty short. Uh, we only see in verse 5 that Isaiah was sorrowful about what was going to happen to them because he said his heart was crying out for them. And even though he was prophesying to them, uh, calling them uh, to order, they didn't listen. And eventually the, the wrath of God came upon them. So there's really nothing applicable to us per se that I that I have to bring out of this chapter. Anybody has any questions or thoughts? Okay, chapter 16. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday. Hide the outcast, bewray not him that wandereth. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end. The spoiler ceaseth. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. And in mercy shall the throne be established. And he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab. Everyone shall howl. For the foundations of Kir Haraseth shall ye mourn. Surely they shall be stricken. For the fields of Hezbon languish. And the vine of Sibma, the lords of the heathen, have broken down the principal plants thereof. They are come even unto 
Jazar. They wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out, have gone over the sea. Therefore, I will bewail with the weeping of Jazar, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Hezbon, and El Eli, for the shouting for thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen, and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field, and in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The traders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. Wherefore my bowels shall sound like an harp for Moab, and my inward parts for Ker Har Haresh. And it shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray but he shall not prevail. This is the word that the Lord had spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord hath spoken saying, within three years as the years are high, and the glory of Moab shall be contend with all that great multitude and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. Okay, chapter 16 is a continuation of chapter 15 because Isaiah is still speaking to them. If you also remember, the Moabites used to pay tribute to Israel uh, in, in flock. And then a time came when they rebelled and said they were not going to do it anymore. And they stopped sending it. So Isaiah was kind of calling them back to order, uh, trying to encourage them to reestablish a positive relationship with Israel knowing that nations who side up with Israel, God will side up for them. The nations who turn against Israel, God will turn against them. So that's why 16 opens up by him reminding them to send their tribute to the ruler of the land of Israel. Um, basically, there's nothing uh, doctrinal also, or that I see that's applicable to us today, other than if you make a vow, uh, fulfill it. Ecclesiastes 5 tells us that. Okay. Verse 6 also lets us uh, catch a glimpse of where God's mind is because as you know God absolutely abhors pride. Excuse me. I don't know why I'm yawning. I had a good night's sleep. So verse 6 tells us we have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud. He's haughty and he's prideful and he's full of wrath, all right? Uh, also, the Bible says he lies. God always has a reason to judge a man. God is a very just judge. So I guess at the fullness of the cup of the iniquity of Moab, all these uh, calamities befell them. Any questions, any thoughts? Yes, I have a question. Um, sure. Whose voice is it? Is it the voice of Isaiah the prophet or the voice of the Lord? In verse 9, when it says, Therefore, I will be bewail with the weeping of Jezar, I will water thee with my tears. Whose voice is that? It's the voice of Isaiah. He's weeping over them, he's crying over them, he's prophesying over them, his heart is breaking for them. Because, in essence, he's trying to encourage them, guys, stop straddling the fence, align yourself with Israel, and stop siding up with the, the enemies of Israel. You know, Moab, Moab was like, I don't want to say two-faced because when they helped Israel, they helped Israel. And when they decided they were not going to help Israel, they were not going to help Israel. So it's the voice of Isaiah weeping and wailing over them, encouraging them to come back to God so that they would not have to face the, the dire consequence when the judgment of God falls. Any other question? All right, chapter 17. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aroah are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, which shall lie down and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. 
and in that day shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean and it shall be as when the harvest man gathereth the corn and the rip and rippeth the ears with his arm and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches. Therefore saith the Lord God of Israel. At that day shall a man look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bough and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shall thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish. But the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. Again, talking about Damascus, and Damascus is the capital city of Assyria, and this was not a nation that God cared too much for. Okay. He prophesies to them that they too are going to be uh, totally destroyed. Uh, although there will be a remnant because it's not all of Israel that is of Israel. You remember when they were coming out of Egypt, there were certain people in Egypt that said, let's follow you, let's go with you. So it wasn't just the 12 tribes of Jacob alone that left Egypt. Other peoples joined them. That's what is referenced to in verses 6. Uh, seven and eight, the remnant. Uh, first of all, he's speaking figuratively in verses four and five. In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. All right? And it shall be as when the harvest man gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Raphael. There won't be much to be gathered. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it. That's the remnant as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the utmost fruitful branches thereof, said the Lord God of Israel. There will be a remnant. God always has a remnant. At that day shall a man look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel because the remnants will see the hand of God as having delivered them. And so they will turn to him fully, seeing what has happened to those who remained in apostasy. He says also in verse eight, he will look at the altars, the work of his hands, and he will not have respect to that which his fingers have made, all the graven images and the groves that they would build to be able to put these graven images and worship in them. So there will always be a remnant, even though um, God will totally destroy every nation that's, that is in apostasy or that is that is coming against Israel. Nothing doctrinal that I see that I can um, apply to us practically. Any thoughts, any concerns, any questions? All right, we'll take one more chapter. That's a lot. What time do we have now? Someone put it on the chat. All right. 
I don't want us to do too much. So we'll just do chapter 18 and, and stop. Uh, that would be four chapters already. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go, ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifted up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For for the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches. They shall be left together unto the fowls of the mountains, and to the beasts of the earth, and the fowls, the fowls shall summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. In that time shall the present be brought into the Lord of hosts, of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from the beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. All right, this is in reference, according to my Bible notes, uh, to the areas south of Egypt going down to Ethiopia. All right. Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't recall from my geography that there's any major river in Ethiopia, except if this is referencing the Nile River, because the Nile River is pretty long. And I think it almost gets uh, all the way down to where Ethiopia is. All right. But war is being pronounced to them. Apparently, there were a um, well advanced uh, people or nation, if you like. Um, they were obviously influential and wealthy. They had ambassadors in other nations. They had vessels. So uh, this to me sounds like it's, like it's Egypt, but I'm not, I'm not too sure. All right. Um, the Lord is going to uh, deal with them the same way. Uh, he's going to cut away their wealth. Verse 5 says, before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, when it's just the right time to begin to reap from what they've sown and planted, uh, God will suddenly fall upon them. All of these nations, there's only one reason why God would come against them. It's because of the way they dealt with Jacob, Israel, his firstborn. There's no other reason because Israel was constantly fighting. Uh, even though God said he had given them the land. But the thing God did was not to give it to them just like that. They had to fight for it. All right, because anything we get for free, we don't appreciate and we don't value. But when you've worked for something, then you appreciate it and you treat it with care and respect. Okay. Nothing that I can uh, practically apply. Pastor Lord, yes. Um, I looked up, um, and you're correct. Um, the river in Ethiopia would be the Blue Nile River. Um, okay. So it did it did travel that far down. And okay. This day it's called the Blue Nile or Abbey River, is what the um, internet says. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess when it flowed into their country, they decided to give it a different name, but it would be the same body of water. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, nothing practical that I can uh, bring out of these few chapters that we've uh, read. They are just pronouncements uh, and prophetic uh, damnation one after the other. Um, if there's any lesson to be learned, it is that we should walk with the Lord and walk in a way that's pleasing to him and not take our relationship with him for granted. Uh, don't think uh, because you're saved, 
you can then do whatever that you like. The Bible says to him, to whom much is given, much is required. There's a burden put upon us to live lives that testify of who we are and who we profess to belong to. Uh, I've told you once, I've told you many times, uh, one thing I never want to hear, it just cuts me to pieces, is for someone to say to me, I thought you were a Christian. <sighs> it's the worst thing anybody could say to me. It would, it would mean that I've probably done or said something that is contrary to what I profess. You know, so we should live circumspectly before our God and we should let our life reflect what we profess. Let's not say one thing and do another thing. Profess one lifestyle. And then when nobody's watching, we're doing something else altogether. Anybody has anything they want to share? Any lesson you've learned from today's study? Any takeaways? Uh, Pastor Mo, one thing I would share is that um, one thing I see is that like once I do something that uh, does not does not really show that I'm a Christian, and if if somebody tells me that you know I thought you were a Christian, I kind of use that as a motivation to get back in the right way with God. Yep, we always need to keep short accounts. Doesn't matter what it is. The moment conviction comes. Conviction can come from the spirit of God himself. Con conviction can come from someone who says something that pricks your heart. The thing to do is to keep a short account. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Help me not to do that again. Help me not to say that again and move on. Don't get into guilt. Don't get into condemnation. Don't let the enemy uh, make you camp beside that mistake. Because from that point on, it can begin to take undue advantage of you. Tell him to butt out. It has nothing to do with him. With him, It's between you and your father. And Jesus said, judge yourself so that you do, will not be judged. Once I judge sin in my life, God can't judge me anymore. It's double jeopardy if he does. Once I judge sin and I call it sin and I say I'm sorry, it's done. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That's what the Bible says. All right, we're going to call it quits early this morning. Uh, I hope you found one or two things to take away and to uh, apply in your walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the things that we're learning. The Bible says this book was written for an example for us. And Lord, help us to learn, help us to understand, help us to apply. Keep us in remembrance at all times of the things that we're reading and that we're learning so that we may walk in a way that's pleasing to you all the days of our lives. Thank you for the privilege of being called sons of Almighty God. We ask that you will continue to use us to the praise and to the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for calling in and I'll see you tomorrow. We have prayer. Come. We will pray together as the Lord leads us. Um, there's no agenda, but just come. Let's pray. God bless you all.